welcome back everyone to this penultimate day of our Profiles in Faith series. I want to I want to spend a few minutes this afternoon talking about someone who is probably one of the least known characters of our entire series, a man named Silas. Now, Silas's story is a bit intriguing because it's heavily overshadowed by the fact that the entirety of his narrative is one of accompanying Paul. And Paul, of course, therefore gets all the press. Silas's story unfolds in the 15th through 17th chapters of Acts. Prior to this point, Paul and Barnabas have been a partnership in ministry. They come to something of a falling out, however, and they go their separate ways. Barnabas goes off to Cyprus with a man named Mark, and Paul recruits Silas for a journey through Syria and Cilicia and then throughout the region. From this point, there's a quick survey of churches strengthened and people empowered and, and converted through the ministry of Silas and Paul. Uh, they have a brief stint in jail due to this kind of convoluted course of events that you can read about in, in chapter 16. And eventually, Silas just kind of falls off the map and Paul continues along alone, which we will come back to tomorrow. What I want to look at today, however, is the entry of Silas onto the scene. The backdrop of Silas's appearance is a debate in the church regarding these newly converted Gentile believers created by the evangelism of Peter and others. New churches have been formed, this Gentile branch of believers is growing, and so debate is now emerging as to whether these um, Gentiles should be expected or what should be expected of them as they convert to the faith. The debate quickly gets wrapped up in questions of circumcision and diet and, and other details of the law, but the underlying question is essentially whether or not these Gentiles need to become Jews before they can become followers of the way. In so many ways, it's the same thing we encountered with Peter a couple days ago, this underlying notion that the Messiah was for the Jewish people. Now, the debate, that debate, came back to the apostles, to the leaders of the church who decided that no such conversion, particularly in the question of circumcision, should be necessary, and that the Gentile believers should be informed that they could enter directly into the faith without ever having to go through such a ritual. And that is where we pick up the story in Acts 15. This is verse 22. It says, Then the apostles and elders, with the consent of the whole church, decided to choose men from among their members and to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leaders among the brothers. With the following letter, the brothers, both apostles and the elders, to the believers of Gentile origin in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that certain persons who have gone out from us, though with no instruction from us, have said things to disturb you and have unsettled your minds, we have decided unanimously to choose representatives and to send them to you along with our beloved Barnabas and, and Paul who have risked their lives for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. We therefore have sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to impose on you no further burden than these essentials, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and, and, from, blood and from what is strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So they were sent off and went down to Antioch, and when they gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when its members read it, they rejoiced at the exhortation, and Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. 
Now, I'll be honest and own that there's been something of a stretch for me with this particular story. I was drawn into Silas's role when I was laying out these couple of weeks that we were going to spend in Acts, but I've I've struggled a bit to articulate what it was that drew my attention. At its core, I was just held by the decision of the church leaders to send Silas and Barsabbas, along with Paul and Barnabas, to those Gentile believers. And the more I thought about the story again and again, the more that phrase that kept running through my mind was that words weren't enough. See, the apostles and the elders of the church, they had one goal in this correspondence to the Gentile believers, and that goal was to put their minds at ease. They'd been hearing preaching and teaching that was troublesome to them. They were being told that they didn't measure up to the other followers of the way. They were being told that they were going to have to endure extraordinary measures if they were to be folded into the life of the church. And in the pursuit of the goal of putting their Gentile minds at ease, the decision of the apostles and the elders was that they needed to send living proof of the love and welcome of the church. In the story that follows for Silas, that that's his recurring role. There, there are letters being sent all over the place, to and fro during this time. Much of what we know as the New Testament are the epistles, the letters, and most of those are being shared between individuals and communities during this period that is unfolding in Acts. But again and again with these letters, words weren't enough. Often those letters were accompanied by individuals who served as the human proof of the message they were trying to send. These people were the evidence, if you will, of the validity of the content of the letter. There were words on the page, but the person that stood before them was the reason that they could believe those words. So you see, I guess what has taken me about Silas and frankly about so many others who served a similar role in the early church is the question of whether or not we are aware of those places, of those moments in which our role can and should be the same. As I look out at the gradually opening world around us and am keenly aware of the extraordinary list of unknowns that remain in the face of all of it, I am reminded that in many ways we are entering into a period of consternation that is quite possibly deeper than anything we've experienced as of yet. The tensions are only growing in what we should do, in what others should do, in what leaders should do, in what society should go do. I could go on and on, but... For the past nine weeks, we have recurrently looped around to the underlying principle that we have a book filled with pages, laden with words that tell us that there is a peace, a calm, a comfort, and a hope that we can have in the midst of all our angst. But Silas's story reminds us that sometimes words aren't enough. Somewhere in your life right now, there is someone who needs the human proof that echoes the written promise. Somewhere in your life right now, there is someone clamoring for that which our scriptures offer, who needs the personal affirmation that God can be found in those words. Somewhere in your life right now, there is someone who needs a Silas. A living, breathing, speaking, loving representation of the welcome and love of God. Open your eyes for that. Open your heart to that. And then go and be it. 
Let's be in prayer together. God of glory, the, the promise of your word is beyond words. The hope that we know in you, the comfort that is ours in the spirit, the future that holds us in your son, they are beyond compare. But we know, God, that sometimes the promise of these words aren't enough. So help us to have the wisdom to see those people around us who are clamoring for a Silas of their own. And help us, God, to find the ways to be that breathing, speaking, loving proof of all that you offer into our lives. We pray it in his name. Amen. We have one more day in this series tomorrow as we come back to Paul and, and wrap up the book of Acts. Um, I look forward to seeing you there. Have a wonderful afternoon. Enjoy the weather if you're local. It's beautiful outside. And I'll see you tomorrow at 12.